Hi class, this is going to be my attempt on the urinary system. So let's get started. It's not that big of a system. And it consists of these organs. The kidneys. The kidneys are making our urine. This is the right kidney. And here's the left. The right kidney sits a little bit lower than the left just because we have what organs here in the right upper quadrant the liver a huge organ so everything's kind of just shifted down just a little bit on the right side so you got your right kidney they are in charge of making urine once they make the urine they're going to send it through these tubes the ureters into the bladder the bladder is just an area to store our urine until there's an appropriate or sometimes a not so appropriate time that we have to go pee and once we pee we, go, we are going to expel that urine through an opening a little tube called the urethra into the outside world so those are the organs oops nope, nope. trying to get rid of that this slide is just to let you know that um, these organs of the urinary system are deep in the abdominal cavity. In fact, they are called, what they are called is retro, why didn't I do that? They are called retroperitoneal organs. They are retroperitoneal. The ureters are retroperitoneal too. That means behind the peritoneum of the abdominal cavity. Remember, your peritoneum, visceral and parietal peritoneum, those are the serous membranes of the abdominal cavity. Well, these are behind the peritoneum. So just remember that it may come in handy on some kind of exam that you might be having. So retroperitoneal kidney, ureters, and the bladder, the bladder is actually not e even in the abdominal cavity. It is where? In the pelvic cavity. This is also to let you know that um, the kidneys are way in the back. They are super retro. They are protected in the back by, remember, our floating ribs. 11th and 12th ribs or floating ribs so the kidneys are somewhat protected by those floating ribs there's also a big layer well, some people have more of a big layer of fat than others but there's a layer of fat that surrounds the kidneys to also give them some protection and that is also why sometimes when you, your doctor if you have a kidney problem or they're suspecting a kidney problem they might be kind of you know um, percussing, tapping on your flank area just to make sure you have no kidney problems. Ah, oh, isn't that cute? Hello, kid, kidney. I, I just wanted to show you that. No, no particular reason. Um, but this is a nice way to show you the hilum of the your little kidney. We have a, the renal artery going into the kidney, the renal vein coming out of the kidney, draining the kidney, and we have the tube that makes our urine, the ureter taking um, urine that the kidney made down into the bladder. So this area where we have the blood vessels going in and out and the ureter coming out, that is your hilum the hilum of the kidney. Remember your hilum of your your lung? Same basic principle. So let's see. This is your model from, from um, school. Uh, we'll go through each of these and hopefully I won't make such a mess drawing all over the place but I'll show you all these structures so the fibrous capsule well I call it fibrous renal capsule it's just the renal capsule but it is this outer 
layer on the outside right here. And this is going to be surrounding the kidney. The kidney is a pretty soft organ, but it's protected somewhat by this fibrous capsule made up of dense irregular connective tissue. So it gives it some form and, and some protection. So that's your, your renal capsule. The renal cortex, now remember the, the cerebral cortex of the brain? It was just that out, outer layer of the cerebrum. Same thing with the kidney. So this outer layer goes all the way around here, this lightened area. I'm just doing this one section, but it goes all the way around the kidney. So this area in here, this lightened area that goes all the way around the kidney, this is the cortex. The renal pyramids. So the renal pyramids, they look like pyramids. Here is a renal pyramid. It's these darkened areas that are underneath this cortex and each kidney is going to have around six to ten, somewhere around that. Um, this kidney has what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven pyramids. So those are the renal pyramids, these dark red, reddish brown looking structures that are um, underneath the cortex. A renal papilla. What is a papilla? A little nipple. So let me clear this off so we can. Here is our renal pyramid, yes. Here is the renal papilla. It's this little nipple region that is sticking out down here. So every renal pyramid has a renal papilla. Renal columns are this area, it's actually um, the same kind of tissue of the renal cortex that's dipping down in between the pyramids. So this is a renal column. So they're going to be in between the pyramids. So those are going, here's a big renal column. So the renal column, the renal medulla. Let me clear this up. So if we have the cortex is here, the renal medulla is going to be the, um, it's, it's deep to the cortex, so I'll just put it here. It's deep to the cortex. So I'll just do it all the way around. So it's going to include the renal um, pyramids, and it's going to include the renal columns. Do it like this. This is the renal medulla, this area. So it's deep to the cortex, but it's before we get to these structures. So that is the renal um, medulla. Now a minor calyx, so let's clear this off. So we said these were the renal papillas. So once um, we, we'll talk about how we make urine, but once we make urine, it's going to start dripping urine, formed urine, into these little areas called minor calyxes. So this one's cut open for you. This is a minor calyx. Every renal papilla is dripping its formed urine into these minor calyxes. Now a minor calyx is going to merge two minors calyces are going to merge to form a major calyx. 
So this is a major calyx where two minors merge. So we're going to have a major calyx here, major calyx here. So, and then the major calyces are all going to form this area called the renal pelvis. So this is the pelvis. And the pelvis is going to become the ureters. So this is a ureter. So ureter, pelvis, major calyces, minor calyces. So this is all urine. Once you get into this area, this is all urine. It is ready to go. The hilum, we've already done our little hilum. We have our renal artery that is coming off of who? The abdominal aorta, bringing O2 and nutrients to our kidney. And we have our renal vein that is taking up our deoxygenated um, blood um, and the nutrient poor blood back to the inferior vena cava. So this is going to the inferior vena cava, and this is coming from, remember, your abdominal aorta. So good blood supply into the, the kidney. That's why the, the kidney, remember we talked about the kidney is so red because it's got lots of blood flow, lots of blood in this kidney. It gets about 20 to 25 percent of your cardiac output. That's a lot of blood. Cardiac output is going um, to these kidneys. Bloody, it's a red organ because it's got a lot of blood flow, just like our liver. A lot of blood flow in that liver, too. So let's look at the renal artery, let's look at the blood vessels. So we already said, here we have our renal artery. This is our segmental artery. Then we're going to have our interlobar, interlobar right here. The interlobars are actually in those renal columns. So these are the interlobar. interlobars and then we're those interlobars are going to turn into arcuates arcuates right here they, they kind of like make an arch they're right in between the renal pyramid and the cortex so here's the area of the arcuates right here the arcuates are going to give rise, the arcuate arteries are going to give rise to the um, interlobular arteries. Do not confuse interlobars with interlobulars. Interlobars are in between the renal pyramids. Interlobulars are up here in the cortex of the kidney. Now, as far as the, the veins are concerned, remember veins are going to be taking up the used up blood, so they're going to go in the opposite direction. We're going to have our interlobular vein is going to drain into the arcuate vein. Then it's going to go down into an interlobar vein. Don't ask me why, but there is no segmental veins, only segmental arteries. So, oops, what happened to my thing? Oop, there it is. Then we're going to, from our interlobar veins, we're going to go into our 
renal vein back to the inferior vena cava. So here's a renal vein. So not too bad, just go over it with your model. It's, they're pretty self-explanatory. Now uh, there's this term, the renal lobe. A renal lobe is a renal pyramid. Let's see which one will I pick. I'll do this guy. So here's our renal pyramid with the cortex above it. So here's its cortex above it. So this is going to be one renal lobe. So obviously we have, I think we said we had seven pyramids in here, so we would have seven renal lobes. So there's a renal lobe, the renal pyramid, plus the cortex above it. Now here is, um, back to your model, here is a renal lobe. So this is actually showing you a close-up of one renal lobe. Here is uh, the, the pyramid. The pyramid is in the medulla. And here is the cortex. Cortex, the medulla. Medulla, that's where the pyramids are. So far, so good. So now we're going to talk about um, nephrons. Now, hopefully you've read your lecture notes and you know what a nephron in is. So nephrons are the functional units of the kidney. They are what is making the urine. You have around a million, million, nephrons per kidney. So nephrons, functional, write that down if you don't remember, functional unit of the kidney, they make urine, about a million of them in each kidney. So let's go back and see where we took off. Let's see. Um, <laughs> now here, this was our interlobar artery, right? Interlobar. Here is our arcuate, arcuate artery. And then we are going, this is our interlobular artery right here. We have another interlobular artery here. Now we're going to start going into the nephron. We are leaving arteries and go, going into arterioles. Remember arterioles are smaller branches of arteries, much smaller than an artery. So we're going to leave our interlobular artery and go into this structure which is called an afferent arteriole. Remember afferent means taking something towards something. We had our afferent neurons and efferent neurons. Remember that from a long time ago? Afferent takes it towards something. Efferent takes it um, away. So we are, in this case, we are taking blood into a structure called the glomerulus. This is this little ball. Here's our afferent going into a glomerulus right here. Here is an afferent going into, you can't see the glomerulus here because it's hidden by this structure called the Bozeman's capsule that's surrounding the glomerulus. But the afferent goes in, takes it to the glomerulus, and the efferent comes out. Efferent comes out. Afferent goes in. Efferent comes out. Efferent is going to go into these structures called the peritubular capillaries. We'll talk about those some more. And um, peritubular capillaries. Vasorecta, I'll show you that on another um, picture. Those are in 
juxtamedullary nephrons only. We have two types of nephrons. We have cortical nephrons. So cortical cortical nephrons. Cortical nephrons, what that means is most of their nephron is located in the cortex. So here's the cortex. So this is a cortical nephron. We have, um, here's our, here is a cortical nephron. I'll just circle it. Cortical nephron. That is a cortical nephron. A juxtamedullary, juxta means next to the medulla. Here is a juxtamedullary nephron. Here we see the afferent going into the glomerulus. But look at this guy. He's much closer to the medulla. Remember, this is the medulla down here. Juxtamedullary. And what else? Oh, hey, let me circle him. This is his parts. Juxtamedullary. And look at this structure here. We haven't talked about him yet. This is the loop of Henley. Look how far down he goes into the medulla. Re he is really deep. So cortical nephrons, their glomerulus is, is higher up in the cortex. This little thing called the loop of Henley, we'll talk about him in a little bit, is closer to the cortex. Juxtamedullary nephrons, their glomerulus is closer to the medulla, and they have a deep, a really deep loop of Henley. Now the tubes of the nephron, those were just the blood vessels. The tubes of um, a nephron are, are what is going to be carrying something called filtrate, that is pre-urine, and finally urine. So the tubes do not have blood in them. They are not blood vessels. They are tubes that are carrying pre-urine or urine. So we are first going to have our Bozeman capsule. So these little balls right here are Bozeman's capsule. Here, the Bozeman's capsule has been cut and removed the top part, so you can just see this little C-shaped part of Bozeman's capsule, and then you can see the glomerulus inside of him. So here's another Bozeman's capsule that's been cut, but all these balls are Bozeman's capsules. Then you're going to have a proximal convoluted tubule. So proximal means closer to, and it's closer to Bozeman's capsule. So this convoluted tubule that's going, you know, making lots of twists and turns that's coming off the Bozeman's capsule, let me just erase this so you can see. This is the proximal, here's Bozeman's, here's the proximal convoluted tubule coming off of Bozeman's capsule. Here's a proximal convoluted, that means twisted, tubule coming off of this Bozeman's capsule. Those proximal convoluted tubules are going to go into a structure called the loop of Henle. Here is the descending loop of Henle going down and the ascending going up loop of Henley. The ascending loop of Henley is going to merge with the distal convoluted tubule. Distal because he's farthest away from the Bozeman's capsule. Distal convoluted tubule is going to merge 
into this structure that's going all the way down. This is the collecting duct. Collecting duct. And then this is going to be P right here. So this is the descending loop of Henle. A sending loop of Henle. A sending is going to merge into the distal convoluted tubule. Distal convoluted tubules are going to go into the collecting duct. This one's going into the collecting duct. There's lots of distal convoluted tubules that are going to be going into respective collecting ducts. And the collecting duct is just carrying our formed urine down. And remember this part is the renal papilla and the renal papilla is going to be pointing into what? The minor what? Calyx. So make sure you have all those structures down. If you go through it a few times with the model, you, you should have absolutely no problems. Here is a better drawing um, that actually shows you this is a cortical nephron. And this is a juxtamedullary nephron. Juxtamedullary nephrons have this structure called the vasa recta. The vasa recta kind of looks like a, um, a necklace that's going around. And it's, it's, it's a capillary bed. It's like the peritubular capillaries, but it's going around this long, deep loop of Henle. So that is the vasa recta. These cortical nephrons only have peritubular capillaries. These are the peritubular capillaries of a juxtamedullary nephron, and these are the peritubular capillaries of a cortical nephron. Sweet, sweet. Okay, let's see, where are we? Ah, the last structure on your model. So, we are going to be talking about this guy, a renal corpuscle. A renal corpuscle is made up of a Bozeman's capsule and a glomerulus. So this is a close-up of Bozeman's capsule. So it's been cut in half. Remember, the Bozeman's capsule is covering, this is the glomerulus right in here. But we've cut it in half so you can look inside Bozeman's capsule and see the glomerulus. This is Bozeman's capsule. Remember you saw this a long time ago when we were first looking at epithelial tissue? This is Bozeman's capsule right here. What kind of epithelium was Bozeman's capsule? Simple squamous. Oops, Bozeman's capsule. This is on high magnification. This is lower magnification. So you can see here is a renal corpuscle right here. We got one here, here. You can see the Bozeman's capsule. Glomerulus is this. Glomerulus, glomerulus, glomerulus glomerulus, Bozeman's capsule. This is the glomerulus. The glomerulus is capillaries, twisted up capillaries, so they are also simple squamous. Here is going to be your afferent arterial, afferent going in, Efferent coming out. So this is afferent going in. Arterial. Remember arterials 
and then we go into this capillary, twisted capillary bed, just, um, which is the glomerulus, and this is going to be our efferent arterial. Efferent arterial. Pretty cool that you're actually seeing it right here. This space right here, this is Bozeman's space. It's the space, the distance between the glomerulus and the Bozeman's capsule. That is this white part right here. Bozeman's space. Easy wheezy to see, right? Bozeman's space. And then on your model, what is leaving Bozeman's capsule? This is going to be the, the first part of your proximal proximal convoluted tubule. Prox, P -R -O -X, proximal convoluted tubule. And we go from simple squamous to simple cuboidal here. So when you look at all these little tubules in through here, you know, I, I don't know which ones are proximal and which ones are distal. Some people do, I don't, but you're going to have these areas right here. This is simple cuboidal. These are all simple cuboidal. So these are going to be proximal and distal convoluted tubules all through through the slide. Lots of convoluted tubules. So far so good? Okay. So before we leave and we make urine, I just wanted to go through the flow of um, blood through the kidney. So this kind of shows you the sequence, and you should actually know this flow. Oops, how'd I get on? Know the flow of blood through the kidney. Hint, hint. That means it's probably going to be on an exam. But we are going to start with the renal artery, segmental artery, interlobar, arcuate artery, interlobular artery. So here is our interlobular artery. Then we are going into afferent arterial, the glomerulus, the efferent arterial, the peritubular capillaries, and if we're in a juxtamedullary, we have our vasa recta too. So we're on the peritubulars. Then we are going, leaving the peritubulars, we are going into an interlobular vein. Remember, on each side of a capillary, we're going to have um, an arter um, an arterial blood vessel capillary then we're going to leave through a, a venule that's going to take us back to our veins. Did I just screw you guys up on that one? Arterials interface capillaries, cap, then the small venules leave the capillaries and take the blood to a vein. Remember that? So we're leaving the capillaries. We're going to go into an interlobular vein, an arcuate vein, so now where are we? Interlobular vein, ar arcuate vein, interlobular vein, arcuate vein, interlobar vein, no segmental veins, interlobar vein, and into the renal vein that goes back into the inferior vena cava. So go through this just a few times and you should be able to trace it out yourself and make sure it makes sense to you. Now I wanted to do a close-up because I'm going to try to show you how we make urine. So what am I showing you here? This is Bozeman's capsule, right? So this is going to be our Bozeman's capsule. 
we have our afferent arterial okay what happened here we have our afferent arterial which is it is coming from an interlobular artery then we're going to our afferent arterial afferent arterial is taking it into the glomerulus which is this capillary bed here twisted capillaries and then it's going to leave the capillaries through an efferent. So what do you need to know about this? Well, we are going to take blood. We are going to take blood. And we are going to filter it. We're going to filter that blood. Filter the blood. And we are going to make our urine. You saw the filtration um, before through another capillary bed, the choroid plexus, where we filtered blood and made CSF. Well, we're not making CSF here. We are making something completely different, but the concept is kind of the same. We are taking blood. We are going to be filtering it, and we are going to removing stuff from the blood and eventually making our urine. So how do we do that? Well, if, if you look at the, the diameter of the afferent versus the efferent, the efferent diameter is smaller, so the blood's going to come in here, and there's going to be a higher resistance for the blood to get out. So there's going to be kind of a pressure buildup back and through the capillaries. And remember, capillaries are only one um, cell thick. They are simple squamous. So that is going to start forcing fluids out of these capillaries. Now what's going to come out is we're going to have lots of H2O come out. We're going to have glucose come out. We're going to have salts and electrolytes like sodium chloride, that's just table salt, potassium, and we're going to have some amino acids, which are small amino acids, and we're going to have something called urea. Remember what urea was? When we break down protein, when we use protein as a food source, we're going to break down protein, and protein is going to release NH3 ammonia, which is BAD. It is bad for you. It is toxic for you. We don't want ammonia running through us. So our liver, remember our good old liver? A liver is going to take that ammonia and convert it to urea. Now urea is still toxic in larger quantities, but it's not as toxic as ammonia. So, but it's still bad. We still want to get it out of our system. This is why when you go into a nursing home and it sometimes smells like ammonia, it's that smell, that is because you are smelling all that urea. And usually they have diapers in nursing homes and that urea builds up and it can start smelling. So that's what you're smelling. Urea, just it's a, <clears throat> it's a converted, less toxic form of ammonia. What you are not going to get filtered out, these are all small little particles that are filtering out. You will not, will not, and this is important, filter out big things. And what do we mean by big things? You will not filter out proteins, large proteins. Those are too big to come out. Proteins will not come out. You, red blood cells will not come out. Those are too big. They stay in those blood vessels. And white blood cells, which remember white blood cells are almost always larger than red blood cells. 
you should never, never, never see these in urine. Never, never, never see these in urine. If you start seeing these in urine, there's usually something wrong with the kidney. First thing that's going to usually filter out when the kidney's not working is proteins. They're the smallest, um, so they're the first to start slipping through if you have a problem with the kidney. <clears throat> so if you see a question and it says, should you see proteins, red blood cells and white blood cells in the urine? The answer will be no. No. Okay. So now this is our filtrate. It's non-selective, non-selective filtration. Selective filtration. What does that mean? It means we are just filtering out the stuff from our blood. It's, it's basically what's in plasma, but not the big stuff. And we're not saying you go, you stay, you go. It's just non-selective. Everybody out. I don't care if you're good or bad. You're all getting out. And it's just all coming out. But there's some stuff that maybe we don't want that glucose to be peed out. Maybe we don't want that amino acids to be, peeled at, be peed out. Or that water. Maybe we want to recapture that water. Well, that's what the next part of our nephron is going to be doing for us. So let's see. Bum, ba, bum. Okay, this is my drawing of the tubes. So we have, do a recap, this is Bozeman's capsule, yes. Bozeman's capsule, so the filtrate is going to go into Bozeman's capsule. It's going to enter into, this is the proximal convoluted tubule. Then it's going to be sent down into the descending loop of Henle. And then it's going to go up through the ascending loop of Henle into the distal convoluted tubule. And finally, into our collecting duct. So far, so good. Now I'm going to add something. Let me add, oh, what color? Do light brown. This is going to be in the cortex. Remember your cortex? And this part is going to be in the medulla. This is down in your pyramid, right? So almost everything is in the cortex except for um, part of our loop of Henle and our collecting ducts. So now let's add, these are just the tubes. Remember what's in the tubes is going is either pre-urine, it's filtrate, pre-urine, or once it gets down here, it's urine. No blood vessels yet. So now let's add our blood vessels. We have our afferent going into our glomerulus. <laughs> I'm drawing the glomerulus. So we have our afferent arterial coming in into our capillary bed and then we have the efferent arterial leaving. So far so good. Now we had we had glucose, amino acids, urea, salt, potassium, and we have wa water all through all through our tubes, right? So that's all through our tubes. Now what we're going to be doing is is trying to either recapture some of the stuff that we want that's in the tubes, but there's also stuff that's still in our blood that maybe we don't want. We cannot push out everything through these pair um to through the glomerulus. 
So this efferent arteri arteriole is going to turn into our peritubular capillaries. So peritubular means what? It is just around the tubes. Peri, around the tubes. So peritubular capillaries. So now what we have, let me get doop boop green. Say we want this water. We want to get this water out of the tube. We want it to go back into our blood. We are going to reabsorb that water back into our blood vessels. We don't want to pee it out. Maybe we want to reabsorb this glucose. Uh, let's put, well, uh, let's put this glucose. We'll re we're not going to reabsorb him up here. <laughs> he can't be absorbed from Bozeman's. But let's have a glucose. Say so we have some glucose over here. We don't want to pee that glucose out. We want to reabsorb them into our blood vessels. That's called tubular reabsorption. We are reabsorbing the stuff our body wants into our blood vessels. We want to keep it. Now, in our blood vessels, we are still going to have waste products that we don't want. We're still going to have urea in our blood vessels. Maybe we have some um, salt that we don't want. So if we have stuff in our blood vessels that we want to pee out, your body is going to do tubular secretion. It is going to secrete what we don't want in our blood vessels back into our tubes. So whatever is in our blood vessels that we don't want, we are going to secrete it into our tubes. I don't want you. Get out of here. I want you to be peed out. So tubular absorption, reabsorption, I want to keep it in my blood. I'm going to suck it out of the, the tubes and take it back into my blood. Our tubular sec secretion, I don't want you in my blood. I want you to be peed out. And then it's going to make its way down into the collecting duct. Now, this collecting duct, if, if we still have, we're always going to have, most of our pee is still water, H2O. So we're still going to have some water in here. Now there is a, a, if you have not been drinking enough fluids, I'm talking about water, I'm not talking about alcohol, but if you've been drinking, you haven't been drinking enough water and your body senses that you are dry, your pituitary gland, remember your good old pituitary gland and its good old cella tersica? up in the brain, there's a hormone called ADH, anti-diuretic hormone. It is a hormone, anti-diuretic hormone, ADH. If you Diureses, diureses, a, a diuretic will make you pee. If you give someone a diuretic, it will make you pee. If you give someone an anti-diuretic, it's going to hold on to the urine and concentrate that urine. So if you are, if you are dehydrated or your body senses you need more water, the brain will secrete ADH this hormone, this hormone acts on the collecting ducts. So ADH acts on the collecting ducts. And if there is any other, um, any more water that we can reabsorb into our peritubular capillaries, we are going to do it. 
that ADH says, hold on to all this water. We want to keep it. So what comes out here is going to be concentrated urine. You've all seen concentrated urine. It's dark, dark yellow. That is because of the action of ADH. It's recapturing any last water. And there's still going to be some more water, but not much. It's going to be capturing in all that water in that collecting duct. So that's pretty much it. Um, that's the basics of how we make urine. What else do I want to tell you? Oh, so what is what is a diuretic? So what is a diuretic? Um, so do you do you buy beer or do you rent beer? You rent beer. Beer is a diuretic. Beer is a diuretic. All this H two O in the collecting duct. It's in beer inhibits ADH, so you are just peeing out dilute urine. The more you drink, the more dehydrated you get. If you all had that experience, you've been drinking lots of beer, and you wake up in the morning, what are you? You are thirsty. Do not reach an, for another beer. If you are thirsty, do not drink beer. It will make you, it will diurese you. It will make you dry. It will dehydrate you. What else was I going to tell you? Oh, about um, going to a bar. Why do they give you pretzels and peanuts at a bar? Not because they like you. They want you to drink more salt so you'll be even thirstier and drink more beer. And it's a vicious cycle and you just keep peeing, peeing, so you're more thirsty, and then you keep drinking more beer. Anyway, that's my two cents on that. Um, I think that was it for, for this. I'll, I'll do another video on going once we get to the bladder. But that was it. I think that, oh, here's my last one. It's basically a recap on tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. So if you do have any confusion on that, hopefully just kind of recapping it here, it will make sense to you. <laughs> I think that's it. So hopefully this will help you guys, and I'll see you in class. Bye!